Good morning. Welcome to St. Philip's. We are delighted that you're here worshiping with us this morning, uh, whether in person or through your screens. Um, if you have any questions about who we are, we encourage you to call the church office or to check our website for additional information about our ministries and worship services. A couple of announcements. One is that a Zoom book study will begin on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock in the morning. We are going to start with the book Holy Envy by Barbara Brown Taylor. If you are interested in signing up for this, please email or text me before Tuesday morning. Um, the more the merrier. All are welcome. And the second announcement is that because we are in October and November, we, like hundreds of churches all over the country and probably the world, are entering into the fall stewardship campaign. So over the next week, couple of weeks, you will see conversations um, between or among me, between me and some parishioners about how we're faring during this pandemic and then why it is that we are motivated to support St. Philip's with our time, our love, and our money so that we continue the ministries that we're doing. So you'll hear from us and you'll hear from, get letters and postcards and you'll be hearing some things in sermons to talk about the blessings that God has given us already. Welcome. Blessed be God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Leviticus. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, are holy. You shall not render an injustice judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, nor will you incur guilt against yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 1. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of the sinners, nor nor sat in the seats of the scorn. Their life is in the law of the Lord, and they they may not have fallen day and night. They are like winds fanning by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed.
the Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. While preparing for preaching this weekend, I came across a quotation from Frederick Beekner that I'd never heard or read before, and it struck a chord deep within me. Like many of you, I have wrestled mightily with the beginning of this gospel passage, wondering at various times if I have mostly failed at the first commandment, and entirely failed at the second. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not always in a mood of not loving God with all of my heart, soul, and mind, but sometimes, yes. Fail I have, to quote the Yoda, the famous prophet, loving your neighbor as yourself seems to be even harder. Here's Beekner's quotation. By loving God and your neighbors, Jesus doesn't mean loving as primarily a feeling. Instead, he seems to mean that whether or not any feeling is involved, loving God means honoring and obeying and staying in constant touch with God. And loving your neighbor means acting in their best interests, no matter what, even if you personally can't stand them. <laughs> Beekner's right, you know. The emotional power of what we understand love to be has translated its way into what love feels like for us, rather than a man or a state of being. But I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me set the scene from the conversation we just heard between Pharisee, the Pharisee, Jesus and the Pharisees. It's the last week of Jesus' life. Over the past few, few days, Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem and with shouts of Hosanna accompanying his path. Almost immediately, he began turning over the money-changing tables in the temple and telling stories that made people either gasp or scratch their heads or maybe even cheer, depending on who you were. Stories about laborers in the vineyard all being paid the same no matter how long they worked in a day. A story about a wedding feast where people were killed. And another story about greedy, greedy tenants killing the landlord's son. All of these stories were told, likely in a crowd, in answer to questions from the Sadducees and Pharisees who were fearful of him because of how many people were following and listening to his new promises. And fear often turns to rage, and rage often turns to revenge. So the Pharisees are trying to trick him. They're laying a trap. Each time, the temple leadership is disappointed because he turns their questions around so that they are the ones who come out looking bad. This last exchange is the final blow, and now their fear turns to plotting the end of the life of this rabble-rouser who has so constantly challenged their authority and their leadership. We, of course, we know the rest of the story, but we should sit in the place of this conversation for now and think about what it really means that Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus, the person of God, 
What is it that he's really saying? I'm not sure how the Pharisees thought Jesus would answer the question. After all, he too had been raised in the Jewish tradition and steeped in knowledge of scripture, history, culture, tradition, the law, and the prophets. But never mind the Pharisees. What about us? What do we think about what Jesus has told the Pharisees? These last seven going on eight months of living in a pandemic have been among the most stressful of many people's lives. As a church and in churches across the country and churches across the world, we have learned new ways of communicating, worshiping, and ministering to God's people, to family, friends, neighbors, strangers alike. We've had unrest and protest this summer about racial injustice. We're in the middle of a rhetoric and the pain of a difficult election cycle and the worry always about our, the safety of those we love. <clears throat> All of this has contributed to a lot of unease about who are our neighbors. But again, Bigner's right. He tells us very explicitly who our neighbors are, and he means exactly what Jesus means. Everyone is our neighbor. From the physically distanced next door neighbor we have to those we know and love and to those we most definitely don't know or especially don't like very much. Because while I think that God is very forgiving of human emotion and error, God has every right also to expect and to command that we act in the very best interests of those around us. In short, I believe that if I deserve justice and mercy and equality, then for sure everyone around me deserve exa deserves exactly the same. And it becomes my responsibility to act in the interests of everyone around me to be sure that what I have or want is what others have or want as well. It takes a long time, it has taken a long time, and it still won't always come out even in this world. But loving my neighbor means working on behalf of the unknown, the unloved, and the unnamed. Working, working on behalf of them with exactly the same power and amount of zeal that I have on behalf, that I work with on, those, on behalf of those I do know, that I do love, and that I do name. It's a powerful statement of faith and an even more powerful statement that confirms the first commandment. When we love our neighbor as ourself, then and only then can we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and all of our mind. I'm not actually sure if Jesus treats them as two commandments, even though he says it. It's, al it's almost as if the first commandment is a bridge to the second. And the only way back to the first is to live out the second. So one of my roles today and for the next couple of weeks is to talk about stewardship. And I know it seems that up to now I've talked about God and love and Jesus, which to me entirely encapsulates the theme of who we are and what we do with stewardship. Here's the important part. God created the world and all that is in it, including the earth and the sky, waters and lands and all the creatures of the earth. But God gave humans the care of this creation. God made us the stewards of creation and charged us with making sure that it flourishes. God gave it to us, not just Adam and Eve or Sarah and Abraham or Noah and Nama. In case you didn't know that, that's Noah's wife's name. <laughs> you, me, me, all of us are in charge of creation. We are all stewards. To be a steward means willingly taking on the care of whatever we've been given. Churches, communities, families, and all the other ways that we group ourselves depend on us for sustenance. And all that we have in these churches and these communities came first from God's creation. We have, may have had a great hand in the flourishing <clears throat> and sometimes the decaying, if we're honest, <laughs> But God gave it all to us first. We created nothing out of the goodness of the world that God did not first bless. Stewardship in the church means taking care of the creation assigned to us in this acreage. 
It means making sure it flourishes not only for now, but for the generations of those who come after us. <coughs> it's about committing our resources of time and our financial pledges to care for our creation. With God's blessing, St. Philip's has created ministries over the decades that move into 2020 that help us love each other, to love the neighbors that we know and those that we don't know. And we should be very proud of that, but not to rest in that pride. Stewardship, then, is the free offering of our time and our money to make sure that God's creation grows and flourishes. Plants, vegetation, humans, nothing in the world is sustained without a commitment from someone for its nurture. The fact that you are either in church today or listening through whatever screen you have in your home means that you, as a, that you have a, there's a testimony to your care and your nurture of all that is good. And I believe that you will accompany that testimony with the blessings of your gifts of time and financial resources to St. Philip's for the coming year. We are each other's neighbors because God loved us into being first and then trusted us to love each other. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of God, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made known. For our sake, he was crucified with the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayer for peace. In peace we pray for you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. 
Always with you. And also with you. Peace. Peace. Please be seated. Walk in love as Christ loved us, giving himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
All things come of thee, O Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and dark angels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, you gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with blessed Philip and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. These are the holy gifts of God for the holy people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Go forth now into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.